let's get going. So we are live on Zoom and live on Facebook. So welcome everybody um, out there in the world. Welcome again to this Residence Academy's six weeks overview of our Unified Science program. And my name again is Marshall's Academy and uh, also author of the book called Cosmometry, Exploring the Holofractal Nature of the Cosmos uh, and the module we're touching into today um, brings in some of the ideas that are presented in that book. So, uh, and as usual, I'm here with Nassim Hermi, who is RSF's founder and director of research. And today we are also are, are being joined by Jamie Janover, who is our de facto RSF ambassador for having given presentations on unified physics and ancient cultures worldwide for many years. Uh, this six week series is being offered to provide an introduction, just a high level introduction to the courses, uh, to the course that are about the subjects of each of the six modules of the course, covering one module per week. Um, and just again, to re reiterate, this isn't a, a study process. Uh, you're welcome to go through each module per week if you want, but it's not a requirement to go through the six weeks that we're offering here. So no pressure. Um, and we're in our fifth week of our six week series of these live webinars. And we're excited to say that over 20,000 people have now signed up for the free online course, which is available at resonancescience.org. And so if you're not aware of that course, that's where the material we're discussing is found at resonancescience.org. You can sign up for free for our unified science program. And, um, and I wanted to say that these webinars give you an experience of what the monthly live with Nassim Q&A sessions are like, which are included in the RSF membership subscription program. Uh, and as well, there will also be monthly Q&A sessions with faculty, including myself and William Brown and Jamie and Adam Apollo and others. Um, so if you'd like to continue with these sessions, we welcome you to become a member at, for that subscription. Um, and we're thankful to say that due to popular requests by our worldwide community, um, we have actually added higher amounts, monthly amounts. So you guys can provide us even greater financial support as you choose. And we're just so appreciated, appreciative that many people said, you know, I'd like to be able to contribute more. So we have those options available uh, for you. And you know the income from this support, um, along with our individual donations and our elective courses, is what makes it possible for our small team to do the great work that they do to provide this course and, and our other resources. So we're deeply grateful for all of that. Thank you so much, guys. So today we're going to share an overview of module five of our program, which is called Ancient Origins and going into the, the deep roots of where unified physics as a, and as a model can be found throughout history. So uh, let's start diving into that. And I just want to welcome first Nassim to the webinar and we'll get Jamie in here in a little bit. But uh, Nassim, welcome again. Always good to be here with you and sharing these ideas and get some questions from our community. So how's it going for you out there in this crazy world <laughs> these days? <laughs> It's going well. Uh, I uh, I was wondering, um, do you, is it just me, uh, Jamie? But um, it seems like Marshall is uh, having bandwidth issues. Um, is that with everybody or yeah, just breaking up? You're muted, Jamie. So we you're muted, Jamie. Jamie. Sorry, it's hard to say whether it's Marshall or or me or Zoom or where in the chain it is, but uh, yeah. I hear that too. Hopefully oh, you it get sounds that like too. it's a little better. Okay. Well, in any case, um, welcome everybody. It's great to be on the call with you guys. And 
Uh, I'm excited to do module five. Woohoo! Uh, after uh, module four, that was, uh, you know, a really good module to talk about the unification of physics and the unification of science in general. I love jumping into module five, which is like bringing us back to our roots and the roots of unified science um, before um, there was a, um, you know, a uh, fractalization or a fracturization of the, uh, of the scientific community and the structure um, of our understanding of the world. And to actually come back to the roots of the information and the evidence of that advanced uh, capacity um, on our planet all around the world uh, is kind of like where um, it might be a little bit painful for some people, uh, you know, at moments. Don't worry, it's only momentary. Um, but it's like jumping from um, very futuristic ideas about what unified science is going to bring to us, including, you know, space travel, gravitational drives, infinite amount of energy and all this, which tend to bring us into the future. Module five is the part that reminds us that that future um, is, was our past as well. <laughs> and uh, that there was evidence of this very advanced knowledge already on our planet a long time ago. And that they left us information um, that guides us through this unified view of physics and science in general. But, um, but even if you discard the concept that there was a more advanced civilization on our planet or that you know, they might have been in contact with um, universal communities out there. Um, and we talked earlier, I think, Marshall, about the probability of life in the universe being very, very high. And so um, even if you discard all this um, and you would um, just assume that there is a fundamental structure of creation, meaning that, you know, there is, um, you know, some kind of organizing factor. Um, and I'm not talking about a God somewhere that's ruling everything, but more of a structure uh, or a field of information that connects everything. Um, if we come to this conclusion, if we see this, then you would expect that through history, through thousands of years of history, eventually um, this nature of creation would emerge from our different civilizations, uh, our different morses, our different philosophies and so on, that they would converge, that you could put the pieces together and get a view of the unified concepts of physics um, and science in general by studying ancient systems that may have got clues of this just because we're made of that unified science, we're made of that unified field and it would, it would basically ooze out of us into the world, uh, into our morses, into our scientific um, endeavors, whether they were very early on or um, you know later scientific advances, which we we discussed in the previous module. So this module is really about actually going back to the roots of the information and uh, exploring some of the symbolism and as well some of the technology that was left from these earlier um, sets of knowledge. And I always want to put it in the context of, um, of the scientific approach to it. That is, um, 
you know, even in the analysis of some of these monuments and, and some of these symbolism and everything that we see in the world, it's important to um, keep, you know, a scientific method going and, you, and come to appropriate conclusions. Um, and what I mean by that is that um, even evidence that may completely counter, you know, previous ideas about ancient civilization has to be considered examined properly analysis proper proper analysis has to be done and you know appropriate conclusion without bias to oh no these people didn't know anything or you know or or bias that he, all of these people knew everything or anything like that but just to look at the data and look at the evidence and i want to as well clarify that in module five i've not been able to put you know, like a, a quarter or, or a very small percentage of the information we could have put in that module to make the point that there's so many millions of different examples of, um, you know, either anomalies or knowledge set and so on that would be appropriate to place here. Um, and hopefully we'll be updating the modules module soon uh, as well you know they were written seven years ago and many discoveries in archaeology and anthropology has been made since then um, you know it will be really wonderful um, you know it, it, you have to keep in mind that um, you know you have to do your own research and go and find the information um, as well um, that's out there and there's plenty uh, I think it it um, it speaks uh, uh, about the foundation of our existence as well. And so I, you know, we talked about cosmogenesis in chapter four in, um, in module four and so on. And um, so cosmogenesis, um, like the beginning of the universe and which we show is kind of a flawed concept, like, there is no beginning, there is no end, it's fractals all the way. Um, I mean, you can define a frame of reference and that's fine um, and write physics on it, but there's lots of evidence that there is fractal structures um, from, you know, and, and we talked about in, uh, uh, infinite amount of infinities. Um, in this particular part of the modules, there's this part of our um, genesis as a, um, as a society on our planet and um, and getting a, just as in the cosmological sense, getting a better idea of our genesis is very important to understanding where we are and where we want to go. Um, and so that's really where I was getting to is that um, this module was was included so that, you know, that part of your conscious experience included this, um, this possibility and this very strong probability that our evolution on our planet was not the first one and that there was earlier uh, organizations that were very, very um, uh, advanced um, and that had very high level of sophistication. Some of them that might have been, you know, more advanced than ours. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, uh, 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 Marshall! Um, thank you for that intro in the sim. Um, Sounds and like, like Marshall's audio the is module, um, so we can. Logging. Sorry. Yeah, Marshall. Maybe you have to reboot your router. I think what I'll do is I'll call in. Yeah, that would be great. 
I'm going to continue uh, anyway and uh, with Jamie. So um, there's many things. Oh, we're going to, we still got some delay there on Marshall. Okay, there we go. Jamie? Yeah, keep, maybe just keep commenting. I'll I'm gonna wait till this stops. Um, Jamie, are you able to the audio in a minute? But um, can you hear me just for a moment? No, we cannot hear you properly. Okay, I'll do that. Um, okay, before you do that, I'll call in. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay. All right. So um, let's just start. Uh, Jamie, we, there's already like a bunch of questions. We can answer questions and we can talk about the module. Uh, I want to say that like we started the module. See, if you look at um, the different sections of the module, we started the module with uh, Buckminster Fuller Tensegrity and um, as well with like a, a basic understanding of geometry. And uh, although we've been looking at geometry through the other modules, we are definitely, um, you know, uh, needing to like get a, a, a basic understanding of the relationship of geometry and a little bit of the history of geometry. And we start at um, Buckminster Fuller because uh, Bucky uh, had uh, done a very deep exploration of geometry in more modern times. Although, you know, of course, Pythagoras and Plato before and, and many others. Um, but um, and that Bucky understanding of geometry was very uh, much um, in the context of the scientific knowledge that's present today. And, and of course, many things that we've discovered in science since Bucky have supported many of the things that Bucky was talking about. But as well, uh, for me, it was a really important moment early on when I read Synergetics, which was uh, Buckminster's Fuller's books. Uh, there was two tomes, very thick books. I don't know so many people that made it through those, um, but uh, there was a lot of really important information there. And it really made um, sense in the context of what I was studying in physics and how I was um, describing the structure of space the way Bucky was talking about space and geometry had a direct relationship to what I was finding. And uh, I had gone when I was young, uh, in, in, when I was younger uh, in, uh, in Montreal at the um, uh, 1977 Expo uh, where Buckminster Fuller, where the, U.S. Um, uh, site was a very large buckyball uh, in in uh, the middle of an island in Montreal um, and in the middle of the St. Lawrence River. And I always remembered that when I was young uh, with fond memories, uh, because when I walked into that dome, I realized, wow, you know, that really seems something organic, something, you know, very uh, harmonic with the space. Um, I, I loved the space in there. And uh, eventually, you know, when I studied Bucky, I understood more of what he was thinking when he did the geodesic domes. But as well, um, maybe it had an influence later on in understanding that you have boundaries within boundaries within boundaries uh, as, of uh, spherical functions 
that um, divides space in such a way that we have scaling in the universe. And, um, and it definitely sparks some, ex, uh, some thoughts about how maybe by dividing the space appropriately um, in this uh, scale, we would be able to interact with the structure of space and produce gravitational effects and energy effects and so on. Um, and it really got reinforced when I was studying physics and I realized that space was not empty, that it was full of energy, that there was electromagnetic fluctuation that were occurring at the Planck scale. And that if you structured the space appropriately, according to these equations and this understanding, you could interact with the structure of space at the very, very fine scale and at the very high level of energy and produce effects. And when I was studying ancient civilization in relationship to that, then I realized, whoa, if there was an advanced civilization that was present on our planet, we should see that they would have made very specific geometric, very specific harmonic relationship structures, um, not only harmonic to each other, to, to themselves, within themselves, but harmonic within with each other uh, locally and as well globally. And, and that's what actually you find uh, on our planet. You, you find these highly, you know, why did Egyptians, Mayans, Incas, all these people build pyramids. We find them in China. We find them, you know, all over the place. Um, and they are and then temples with very specific harmonic relationships within themselves and very sp specific harmonic relationship in their position on the planet to each other and so on. So this is um, something that kind of comes together uh, in this module to realize that these things don't just happen by um, by you know, error or, you know, by some random thing where all of a sudden, you know, civilization across the world from each other that supposedly had no contact with each other were building the same geometric buildings uh, with the same demonstration of the same fundamental principles, um, you know, fun fundamental dimensions and, and relationship that have to do with this, you know, the radius of the earth and, the, and, you know, the, the structure of our solar system and so on that you find all this kind of stuff in these various uh, temple and sites all around the world that are very difficult to explain. Um, if we assume that all these civilizations were separated, but if we realize that they were all connected uh, and that they were connected uh, not I mean in the field in an esoteric way but as well connected because they were holding and moving knowledge that was present prior to um, the records we have uh, of these ancient civilization of an earlier civilization that was present before, which most of these ancient civilization talked about um, very, very specifically all around the world. And um, that really is an important concept to realize. And that has been researched in very, very great details by many researchers. And the evidence is very, very strong. It's, it's not a trivial amount of evidence. It's, massive amount of evidence, um, including discoveries that are being made currently. Um, for instance, with uh, LADAR now, we're able to look under the foliage in regions of uh, Guatemala and South Mexico and so on, and we're finding that there is thousands of pyramids under the, the foliage, um, thousands and thousands of, of pyramids that have not been cataloged under the foliage and 
we're talking, um, you know, regions that must have had millions and millions of people living in and so on. And so all these um, eventually leads to um, realizing that this, that they might have been something that was left for us at this time. And that was something, and that is something that we must um, uh, basically um, get back um, because it helps us lead us in the direction we want to go eventually um, in terms of our understanding of the universe and our relationship to it and how to have a harmonious relationship with our environment so that we are producing a positive effect. So I think yes, we have Marshall absolutely. back. Yeah, can you hear me okay? Hopefully uh, my voice is coming through now. Is that right? It's better. It's still, uh, you still have a low bandwidth according to okay. Zoom. Yeah, well, hopefully the voice is coming through on phone correctly. Um, and it's going to be okay. Although it sounds a little funny to me right now. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's doing the same thing uh, again. I have a huge delay. Yeah, I got a huge delay on my signal. That's not going to work for me. Okay. Um, well, you know, try to work it out. We're going to continue with Jamie. Uh, something else. Um, Jamie, we could take some questions. Yeah. Sure. Uh, somebody actually went right for it and uh, asked, what's the source of the vacuum? <laughs> what's the source of the vacuum? Yeah. I mean, going right for the going right for the heart of it, which will be good because it'll help tie us from the vacuum to how the ancients knew what that yeah. was. <laughs> right. Um, okay. Well, you know, first of all, this asking what the source of the vacuum is is like asking what's the source of reality, since we've demonstrated in the physics we discussed in the last few weeks that the vacuum is you know, there's not, there's just one thing and it's the vacuum energy, you know, doing its thing. And then as it does its thing, various components of it, we call matter, electromagnetic fields, gravitational fields, you know, all the constants come out of it. And we've solved this at this point. We've wrote these equations. Olivier and I have been working for the last six months and, you know, they're actually in my windows here you know, I don't know if you guys can see them, but, you know, we've written those equations um, and we've shown that all these scales from, you know, infinitely big to infinitely small. And we found sub Planckian levels with, you know, very, very important sets of information at the sub Planckian level that have to do with um, superluminous capability that is you know, things that are information that's uh, being transmitted at faster than speed of light and all this. But basically we can show now that the division of the structure of space is what produces our reality. Um, and that we're part of this division of space that's experiencing itself, the universe learning about itself. And so this is a continuum of information. Um, this is a continuum of information because of the fundamental nature of an infinite amount of infinities. So for people that weren't there last week, I'm happy to just quickly, you know, can Cantor, uh, one of the great mathematicians of our time, uh, early on um, came up with this theorem uh, of infinite uh, amount of infinities, the fact that infinities could um, have in, with infinities within them. And so it sounds a little crazy, like uh, if it's infinite, how is it that it has, you know, other infinities in it? Think of a fractal and think that you, you isolate one of the scale. Well, let's say you make a sphere and you say, okay, that's my scale and you still can divide to infinity within it. So you have a bounded 
condition, you have something that appears like a finite structure, but it has infinity within it. And when you write these equations, it's clear, it comes out and it gives the right value. I just wanna make sure I'm talking about physics here. It gives the right value for the masses, the radiuses, you know, the, uh, the temperature, the energy from universe to uh, sub Planckian level, it, everything comes out, all the constants, it's, it's beautiful, it's amazing. And it doesn't start and it doesn't end, meaning you can write physics on it because you can, uh, you can analyze any of the scales in the equation. However, fundamentally the equations are telling you that there's an infinite amount of scales. So there's an infinite amount of energy exchange across the scales and, or information exchange across the scale. And that's what is the vacuum energy. It's the exchange of information across all the scales, which you're part of, which is, you know, at the essence of your being, of your consciousness, what you think of um, and what you experience and how you interpret the field is being fed to the whole thing. So that is the vacuum. And it's not, um, it's not um, uh, uh, incoherent. It has structure, it has uh, polarity. It has a very specific way that it, it, it's um, self-organized. Um, and that's what we discovered. That's what we're emerging from. And um, we are, you know, this self-organization of the vacuum, this way of the vacuum to organize is really, um, you know, important to know. And it seems like there was people before us that knew it. Uh, and so that's um, what we're talking about in this module. Great. Let me test my audio again now. How's it coming through? Yeah, that's better. That's great. Okay, I finally, I finally got my phone hooked in. I thought it was before, so. Okay. Should be okay, uh, even if the rest of it's a little choppy. Okay. Yeah, so, um, so you, you covered a lot of ground, Nassim, um, yeah. regarding this module. I got on and, the ranch. Uh, yeah, no, it's good, it's good. Um, and uh, one of the, actually the first question that came in is uh, just regarding the what's called sacred geometry. And, um, you know, uh, let me just pull the question up so I can see how it said is, uh, what well, is sacred geometry? How can it help us understand the unified science approach? And right. you, you, uh, you started to touch into that at the beginning and the, the first sections of this mo module, I'll go into the Buckminster Fuller and the synergetic geometry and how it organizes into these coherent symmetries and structures and that ties into the flower of life, which is obviously found throughout ancient cultures. Um, and so maybe you could talk a little bit about the, the uh, you know, why that's important, not only in the context of ancient cultures, but specifically in the context of unified physics. Right. Um, so, so it was called sacred geometry because that was a way at the time to describe, and certainly in the later, um, you know, in, in middle age Europe and so on, the, a way to describe that it was natural or fundamental geometry it was, it was deemed sacred because it was, it was more than just, oh, it's kind of cool geometry. It was like, oh, this has meaning, mm -hmm. a profound meaning, right? So I, I, in general, I don't like to call it sacred geometry because it's no longer appropriate in the context of today. Um, it, was, it was part of the separation that happened between science and religion um, at the time. And, and it really um, created a, a uh, tendency for the scientific community to try to get rid of sci of geometry um, just because of the esoteric um, association uh, that was made with it. 
And so I, I don't use that terminology because it's it's fundamental geometry. It's it's natural geometry. It's the base of creation. It's it's the base of my existence. So of course it's sacred, <laughs> you know. And all geometry is sacred. The whole thing is <laughs> right. geometry. Um, and so um, I like to think of it as fundamental geometry, and uh, and the geometry of the of the understanding of our universe. Um, and so. Um, you know, and, and as I was saying, it is so you can imagine that um, I, I, it's almost like a meditation, Marshall. I, you know, it's like when I feel, when I start to understand this geometry and I feel it uh, in, my, in my being, in my body, in my consciousness, I open up. It's like, uh, it's like a, a lotus opening. And all of a sudden, I feel the unified field. I feel the connection. I feel the vacuum. Because when you talk to people about the structure of space, tendencies for people to think of the structure of space outside themselves, right? But, but I'm not talking just about outside yourself. I'm talking about the structure of space of your being. Um, that that is the atoms you're made of are 99.9999999% space and so the structure of space within your being is the structure of the unified field and you're actually a manifestation of it and um, and that's really uh, a, a deep realization that can happen in someone's consciousness so that they can actually not only understand the geometry, uh, but as well experience the geometry, uh, you know, experience this um, polarization of the vacuum that makes up our existence. That is something that's very uh, fundamental and important uh, in the evolution of consciousness. Um, because mm -hmm. as soon as that experience is present, then, um, you know, there's all kinds of consequences. One of them being empathy. One of them is being uh, a sense of belonging instead of a sense of isolation, um, a sense of purpose, um, you know, a, a, a sense of community, of, of uh, global and uh, galactic and universal community. You know, all these mm -hmm. things emerge from that realization, which is really important. Mm -hmm. And in that sense, it's sacred. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, one thing that's always struck me as you're talking about your experience of feeling it, um, which I've also had, um, is that the, the words feel and field are so similar. <laughs> and... I mm -hmm. think that's how we actually, we actually, in large part, how we, how we do experience it. You know, we actually feel the field and, um, you right. know, that it's a, it's a, it's a way that we can, like you said, it's a way that we can have a direct experience of, um, that which then we can intellectually understand through the study of the science and really specifically the geometry, which is, uh, a different language it's a visual language and when we see these patterns and we see these geometries they speak to us in a different way than just our rational minds and uh, it's a really important part of the process of learning about this i, I feel right and, uh, when, and even yeah. when we write the equations for um this part of the physics you know it 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 feels and looks different. Um, it has very specific, you know, I mean, for instance, Einstein is known for geometrizing space time for like producing, you know, describing space as this metrical, this structure that can curve. And when it does, it produce gravity. So what I'm saying is that even if it's not a visual uh, thing, um, even just uh, to understand, you know, uh, intellectually, 
the the geometry like the for instance the concept that it's polarized that it's you know that there's angular momentum involved that there's you know spinner to spinner networks that make up geometric structure in space and to feel that you know so so we get we get visual clues from our eyes and we get you know um uh intellectual clues from the mathematics and the physics and then all that put together you know all of a sudden can generate these events in someone's consciousness where they actually feel the field and um and that's why as well many of these temples of course were made or were used at least in the later evolution uh um you know as places to go and experience the field and feel the field um you right know, so yeah yeah that's such a good point you know uh which um ties it into the the relationship to uh what we can see through ancient cultures uh as to how they actually applied the knowledge of these geometries into structure and creating resonant spaces and uh, places of healing and initiation and all of that based upon this understanding um, which is just foundational to uh, what then becomes the application at, at, at more you know greater degrees of um, complexity maybe through technologies uh, that were developed in ancient times and being developed now um, all of that yeah Right. So, uh, maybe we want to bring Jamie into the conversation a little bit. Uh, if you want to come Jamie, on, Jamie. More good questions. You're muted still. There you go. No, yeah, you're not muted. Um, okay. Uh, well, you could go right to the heart of the matter. Um, how was the Great Pyramid built? <laughs> 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 uh, when people ask me that, I always like to answer from the top down, which actually <laughs> that is know. a known theory. Yes, that's right. Um, the, there's definitely actually um, some writing that can be found uh, from ancient time that described this having been built in a overnight from the top down. But uh, you know. Um, I, um, okay, so first of all, these buildings were not um, the only buildings that are impressive on our planet. As many people know, there's a lot of very impressive buildings on our planet. And there's a lot that, um, you know, that challenges <laughs> uh, our capacity to do today to produce um, such uh, results like if we were to attempt to reproduce the Grand Pyramid at Giza uh, today, or any of the three pyramids at Giza, the three main pyramids at Giza, or or some, uh, you know, Saqqara or any place else in that region, um, some of the pyramids there and some of the structures near and under the, these pyramids are remarkable. Um, so basically, you know, the idea that this was all done by people that previously were known to live in the desert, literally in caves uh, and have very low sophistication, uh, very low levels of sophistication. And all of a sudden they produce something like fantastic uh, like this um, is, is very unlikely. Um, and, um, you know, so the question is, how were they done? Well, that demands an analysis of what is present. The problem is that what is present, there's a part that's known that can be found that, that everybody knows about, and there's parts that are being found right now, and there's parts that are not made public that have been found. Uh, as well. And um, 
And so it's it's more than just what is seen, it's, it's what is unseen. Um, some of these unseen parts I've been lucky enough to be able to, to see and, um, and they're very challenging um, in the context of our current uh, understanding of technology. Um, so clearly the way these things were built was not with conventional means uh, of pulling, cutting, you know, literally throwing uh, 20 ton boulders, never mind the, the 200 ton ones and then the thousand ton ones, um, you know, on top of each other. Um, and that um, these uh, building must have been built with technology that was much more advanced and that this technology, whatever it was, was able to move large, very large amount of material from very far with no apparent difficulties or very little, I mean, great ease, we'll call it. And, um, you know, some of those include thousand ton granite, like pink granite from Aswan, um, figures, you know, sculptures that were found in temples uh, hundreds of miles from where they were cut and that would require in current technological capability, you know, massive amount of, um, of, uh, of material that we wouldn't be able to produce and as well, massive amount of focus um, energy for very long periods of time. So um, this demand, so from this analysis, I'm going very fast. So, so the, you know, this demands that there was at one point a certain level of capability of control of gravity, that gravity must have been able to be controlled in order to produce this kind of results. You, you don't just go around with a thousand ton granite boulder in the desert, up mountains, down mountains, across rivers and all this. And, you know, doesn't matter how many thousands of slaves you have, doesn't matter, you know, like there's fundamental difficulties that cannot be overcome with ropes, vine ropes and, and a hundred uh, trillion, uh, hundred thousand slaves. Never mind that they were upgraded to farmers in the last few years because they couldn't find the slaves. So now they were farmers that were doing this on their off time when the Nile was flooding three months out of the year. So you know they had three months to, you know, to hang out. So they decided to build pyramids. Not quite. So basically. Um, gravity control must have been present. If gravity control was present, um, then the stories from these ancient civilizations that are found everywhere on their walls and everywhere in their courtesies and so on about having contact with a very advanced civilization that was there prior to ours, the great stories that you find all around the world of the floods, of the change, the cataclysm that happened, and all of a sudden this civilization was no longer around. And, you know, this evolution started, like all these stories start to make sense. Um, and these, um, and these people clearly, uh, according to these ancient civilization, could fly, could go around the world. Uh, I mean, Think of the Vedic texts that talk of the Brahmanas and so on, and um, and evidence that these um, ancient civilization had, for instance, a good understanding of the surface of the earth, of its size, of many different principles. For instance, precession, which is a very complex principle of the rotation of the earth, and so on, and that um, that span a very large um, you know, uh, cycle, which would be hard to observe, from, you know, without knowing very fundamental physics 
Um, so there's so many things that point that this, so whoever made these buildings, which none of the ancient civilization claim they made, you know, nowhere in Egypt is there a wall that shows, oh yeah, and this is how we built the pyramids, um, <laughs> you know, and, and you, you would think that if they built them, they would have not omitted that since they told us everything else about their civilization, but how they built the pyramids or, or the temples. And so um, there is a lot, um, you know, there to uncover and, and it's not a simple answer, but surely the, and surely the people that did this, did it with very advanced technology because you don't start moving millions of tons of material and arranging it perfectly in, in either pyramidal structures or amazing statues that have perfect symmetry as if they were done by CNC's, which are computer controlled devices that cut, but that could not cut a thousand ton block because we couldn't even have a device that big. We wouldn't be able to put it in the device because we can't get a thousand ton block anywhere, even with our biggest cranes, you know. Um, so basically, um, you know, this advanced knowledge um, is something we have to recuperate and or to to regain. And and the key to regaining it is to understand those fundamental principles of geometry and um, of uh, the structure of space that they left clues all over the place about. And that is where in my earlier study, I realized there was, you know, a possibility of this connection between those two that was uh, critical between advanced science and ancient civilization. Yeah. You know, uh, back in 2017, now we did our trip to Egypt um, as the, you know, the, the Residence Academy uh, delegates that went to Egypt together. And um, when you go and witness these places and you see firsthand the massive size of these blocks and the precision of the fit, same thing in Peru and when the trip is taken there and in Mexico, different places around the world where the, the, there's just such obvious evidence that uh, an advanced technology had to be required. And certainly gravity control because of the immensity of these things. And you can't picture cranes or, or people moving these massive things into place so precisely. And then as well, the, the custom fitting of these oblique angles and multiple angles and curves that fit perfectly together without any gap. It also suggests something that perhaps may have softened the stone in some way right. uh, in order for them to then be put in place and then go back to a hardened crystalline state where that precision is now just completely dialed in, which is a very fascinating thought <laughs> to, yeah, to both the gravity control and that together. Right. Remarkable. Yeah, it's yeah. remarkable. And you, and, you, and you see evidence that's just mind boggling, as you were saying. I mean, you, it's, it's hard to describe unless you see it yourself, you know, because when you give number and statistics, the, the numbers are so large, it's hard to visualize. Um, you know, when you're talking about a thousand ton block, which is, you literally look like a, an ant beside, you know, and um, yeah, when, when right. you, um, you know, or a small bug at, at least, um, you know, a, a, uh, when you look at even at the 20 ton blocks on the Valley Temple right in front or beside the Sphinx and, you, you know, you walk in and it's it, not only the 20 ton block, uh, the 200 ton blocks are covered by, um, you know, they, they're, they're stacked on each other. So a 200 ton block, you know, you look small beside it. But, but they're, they're stacked, and then these are sandwiched between Aswan granite, pink granite, that, you know, is in sheets of 20 to 30 ton, and they, 
you know, with a few feet thickness and, and they, and they're arranged so perfectly that you can't put a razor blade in between after thousands of years of earthquakes and everything else. Yeah. And it just they and some of the some of the scenes are so perfect that most people walk right by without knowing there's a scene there because I mean you some of the scenes um, you literally have to take a picture of that region where the blocks are coming together and then zoom in and analyze to actually see mm. the scene going through because it looks completely smooth as well. I've been brought into yeah. a chamber and I am, I'm just going to call it the chamber. I'm not going to give a position, but I'm just going to call it the chamber. So I, I was brought into a chamber by a certain amount of um, officials. Uh, and in that chamber um, was, um, you know, a, a, a what appeared to be in the uh, resonating cavity. Um, uh, okay, so 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 to give a proper description, uh, the chamber is a resonating cavity that's some 20 meters under the ground, and that's where it starts, and then it's a it's a square, um, it's a square shaft um, that's about seven to eight, maybe ten story high, um, cut hewed into the bedrock, and the top has not been disturbed, so it had to be cut from the inside out, right? Um, and um, and it's perfect. Uh, th those walls are very uh, incredible. But as well, inside is a um, granite, well, it's actually um, durite, uh, which is extremely hard. It's, it's almost diamond hard. It, it's an 8 to 8.2, I believe, on, on the hardness scale, which, you know, is very, very difficult to cut. Um, it, so there's a box in there that actually makes the perimeter of this shaft. So that only a, like there's enough space so that you can walk around it, but it's, the the shaft itself is the size of about you know four typical American houses you know corner to corner to make a square right it's kind of it's huge and this durite box is sitting in there and it's made out of um, sixty some uh, pieces of durite that are immense, each one weighing in excess of 30 to 40 ton, and that are um, welded together. I can only call it that way, so that the walls are, of this box, which is two story high, and the diameter, almost the full diameter of this, this chamber, um, so that the walls are perfectly straight, like, like polish, mirror polish, durite, completely straight, you know, and the thickness of the durite is a few feet thick. And it's just incredible. Like, and this kind of stuff just doesn't happen with um, chisels, copper chisels. Uh, and even if you have <clears throat> iron chisels, it doesn't happen um, this way. It's not really possible. It's, um, it, it's, uh, and this is the first time I talk about this experience, but um, it's very important to know there is many, many of these examples in, you know, the Giza Plateau or in, you know, the uh, Saqqara Plateau or the other regions in Egypt and in South America. Yeah, it's astounding. And in in this module, um, one of the sections is is called "Signs from Ancient Times," and it it goes through various cultures. Um, the lost city of Mirador in uh, Mexico, I believe that would be. Um, yeah. The Chinese connection, the Chinese pyramids, and the the I Ching and the Tai Chi Chu symbology of Taoism, and how that relates to the whole. Uh, fundamental geometry, the 64 tetrahedron, because the 64 hexagrams, 
in the I Ching, directly related to that fundamental geometry, um, and then into the Kabbalistic tradition, um, and how that also relates to the 64 grid. Do you want to comment a little bit about that relationship, Nessian? Sure. Um, you know, so we have all kinds of, um, you know, um, different symbols that were found all around the world. Some of them, you know, um, that are, uh, that were part of these ancient traditions. Some of them that are just engraved uh, on walls in various places in the world that are not, that are kind of lost knowledge um, and, and so on. And um, when you look at these symbols and all the different symbolism, you find that it's like a metric that relates all to the same geometry. That is, you know, they complement each other in different ways that gives you more information about the same thing. So they converge. So for instance, the I Ching um, that um, gives you 64 hexagram uh, of full sticks and broken sticks that if you assemble each of the hexagram, you have you, you, the only result you can get is like tetrahedrons um, in, in the broken stick and, and the full stick uh, allows you to have interpenetrating tetrahedron like a male and a female tetrahedron, you know, one within each other. Um, and, um, you know, these are some of the first realization I, I, um, I, I decoded in uh, my exploration of ancient civilization symbolism uh, early on, but then as well, you know, the, the Sutskin, you know, calendar that's found in, in Mexico and some in South America and so on that have as well, you know, this relationship to 64, which is the ascending column in the middle of the calendar and the geometry and the mathematics of the calendar that gives the same type of information, but from another angle. Um, and then in, in both cases, for instance, and I'm just taking two cases here, there's many, 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 but um, in both cases here, you have on one side the yin and the yang symbol, and on the other side, um, the uh, a symbol that shows like a black and white spiral coming together um, to make the unab cool. And this and the, the two showing the polarity of the structure of space and the spin function, the angular momentum, and all of a sudden, and, and the singularity that's produced as a result, right? Where, where in the uh, Yi Chin, uh, and where in the, the yin yang, you have the black and white dot in both of the, uh, the polarity producing, you know, the, the, the singularity. Uh, and then um, the center of where the spirals meet, producing the singularity and the polarity as well. And so all this start to like give you an idea of the of fundamental principles of physics that were left in these, you know, remarkable region where these very remarkable um, uh, uh, example of uh, of uh, of uh, unknown civilization that seemed to have advanced knowledge, um, you know, was present. Uh, and I'm using the word unknown loosely because there is some clearly there's some writing all the way from ancient civilization all around the world that seemed to have known this, um, but that was lost in you know the later evolution. So. There is relationships you can make, and as you make these relationships, like the Kabbalistic tree, with um, you know the I Ching, with you know the 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 traditions of South America and and Central America, like for instance the uh, solar calendar and so on, all of a sudden it starts to give you a picture. It starts to give you a story, a narrative. Not only does it gives you a narrative 
about the structure of creation and the nature of, of the universe, but it gives you a, a narrative about cosmo, cosmogenesis, about advanced knowledge, and as well, it gives you a narrative about uh, the history of humanity not being a linear history of the last few thousand years, but uh, being a cyclic history that from which you know you can recuperate knowledge or, or acquire knowledge from earlier uh, cycles of the evolution. Yeah, and that's that's what's key here in presenting this module is to recognize that uh, this is a cycle that that the, the physics, the unified physics, the unified science, the fundamental geometry for those maybe that are new um, when we're talking about the 64 uh, geometry and the physics it's the 64 tetrahedral matrix that um, you'll learn about when you go through this module. Uh, mm -hmm. And it directly correlates to these these geometries of these ancient cultures, and and then the the evidence of the advanced knowledge from these ancient times really is indicating that we're in a cycle, and we're like you said, we're we're, we're reclaiming and remembering and rediscovering the that which was known before. And um, another aspect, Ms. Simon, there's a question in here that uh, references in this module as well, the last section has to do with the Ark of the Covenant and the whole journey of the Ark. Uh, and it's a pretty comprehensive overview of uh, the background and the history of the Ark of the Covenant. And then really from the perspective of the physics, what that actually represents, uh, which has been I think uh, a mystery overall with lots of conjecture and right. uh, you've done lots of research in that and um, yeah. have have very specific ideas about what that is, what it was used for and right. how it even would be possible based on the physics. And, uh, but one right. of the questions was about, you know, what happened to that? <laughs> so, right. Well, you know, that's <laughs> the thing. It's like, um, uh, so imagine you're studying all this, you're making, you're starting to realize the relationship between the structure of space and some of the symbolism and some of the, you know, monuments around the planet. You realize there was a, a more advanced civilization prior to this evolution that had information that was really critical to our evolution and to our understanding of physics and the universe and all this. And then the, the first thing you would do, well, at least one thing you would do would be to start looking if they left any technology, you know, that would have, you know, maybe they left pieces of the technology that could inform us about how to achieve this same level uh, in later uh, evolution. Clearly they left symbolism and information, you know, that could be transmitted I mean, if you're going to want to leave a piece of information that you're going to make sure that other civilization very far in the futures would be able to get, um, you'd probably put it in granite on very, very large pieces of granite and, and very, very large buildings so that, you know, the span of time wouldn't be able to destroy all of it. It could destroy some of it, but some of it would remain. Um, so may, when you put the pieces together, then all of a sudden you realize, wait, they must, you know, they must have been advanced technology. Is there still some of this technology? Well, clearly, if you make this, if you get this understanding, then when you see these durite boxes or you see these resonating cavities or you see these buildings, you go, okay, that most likely was part of the technology. Um, but they, they must have been a power source that's missing. You know, they, there's a piece that's missing to make it go. Um, and you then you look in the traditions uh, in all these different countries around the world and you see, oh, they seem to all point again, to converge again towards something, some kind of power source that seemed to have been very sacred, that meaning that, it had to be shielded from 
the uninitiated. There was very, very specific relate rituals around this um, that uh, where only a very few people had access to it uh, and so on. And one of those things was definitely what was called later on by the Hebraic community, the Ark of the Covenant of God, right? The, the, or the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, you know, um, uh, and actually, you know, more clearly, uh, the Ark of the Covenant of the Tetragrammaton, uh, which is actually the translation from the Greek word that described God in the Bible. And so basically, um, you realize that this technology must have had uh, capacity that were gravitational. Uh, for instance, in the case of the ark, you know, certainly spreading water would be, you know, the stopping the flow of, of a river, for instance, would be evidence of gravitational control. Well, it's found in these tradition, uh, not necessarily only in the splitting of the Red Sea, but, uh, you know, early on in, um, in Exodus, but as well later on, you know, with the crossing of the Jordan, you know, in which the Jordan is running at flood level, uh, the, uh, the, the tribes of Israel is unable to cross. So they basically bring this object that they call the ark into the water and the water parts. And so this is a very specific, more detailed, clear description on how they get the water to part in both cases, um, which in the case of the Jordan, they refer back to, the, to Moses uh, using the same effect to part the sea. Um, and, uh, and, and so this would require gravitational effects, uh, some kind of gravitational effect. Eventually, you know, the wall of Jericho are made to tumble with the same object, you know, all kinds of things. The building of the Temple of Solomon happened with extremely large uh, uh, rocks as well. Again, you know, the, the first temple was built with extremely large rock and so on. And the description of this object having, you know, all kinds of effects, both gravitational electromagnetic effects. For instance, if you touched it, you were, you know, basically vaporized. Um, you know, it, it, there's a few instances where it's describing that in the Bible, or people would die from uh, burn all over their body, which is typical of an electromagn, you know, an, an electric shock of very high voltage or very high amperage, and 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 that um, this um, object as well, you know, uh, had to be shielded from people because your consciousness would interact with it, and it would have, it was, it would have impact. It would have effects on you. You had. It was said that you had to be pure of heart to be able to be in its presence. Uh, and, and that if you weren't trained properly, you wouldn't make it. And so when they put it in the Holy of Holy, uh, the high priest had to be trained to go in there. And when the trainees or the initiate would go through the last moment of initiation, which was to go inside the Holy of Holy and be with the ark, um, they weren't sure they were going to make it. <laughs> they, they had little ropes attached to their ankle so that if they didn't make it, they could pull them out, you know, or if they passed out or so on. So without having to go in there. So basically there was, um, you know, evidence that this technology, uh, this device um, had electromagnetic effects and effects on consciousness. Uh, effects on our capacity to evolve, meaning it was changing people. Um, and people that were able to interact with it were people that had positive or at least, you know, um, benign intentions, um, which, meant, which meant that not only 
the, the device had very real physical effects. It had direct interaction with um, the feedback and the consciousness of the being around it. Um, and so, um, you know, studying this, uh, I realized that there's something similar in South America in their customs in these ancient civilizations. They talk about this very powerful, you know, energy source that had to be shielded, that were in temples that were covered in gold, um, you know, something very similar to the Holy of Holy, um, you know, describing the same effects. And then in both region, um, finding, you know, all this kind of buildings that required gravitational effects and so on. So this, you know, leads you to understand that like maybe some of these technologies that of these earlier civilization were still present on our planet in a certain level of evolution and then eventually disappeared. Um, and so I looked for them in many different cultures around the world. And I found analogs to the concept of the Ark of the Covenant. And in this um, global view of this technology, you start to understand what it was and how it worked. And basically what I discovered is that what it was is that it definitely generated a large electromagnetic vortex, vortice in the structure of space. It produced angular momentum in the structure of space to create singularity, um, you, most likely um, using very high accurate um, um, crystalline structures that, um, that were combined with plasma dynamics to produce this effect and that they had a very long time but a uh, uh, long lifetime, these devices, but that they, they would weaken over time eventually because of entropy in the system. And so, um, you know, and, and so I started to look around the world for these devices and, um, and as well, I started to, um, you know, uh, connect the dots to understand how they work so that we could reproduce them in modern time. Jamie. Great. Yeah. Oh, there you are, Marshall. Hey, hey. <laughs> so yeah, Jamie, um, why don't, oh, wait a second. I... Sorry, I got on my wrong line there. There we go. Um, Jamie, why don't you share a little bit about your elective program? Uh, which is all about this topic um, and just kind of introduce yourself a little bit for people who are not familiar with you. Jamie, as I said, is um, what we call an ambassador of Resident Science Foundation and an ambassador of Unified Physics. And he's been traveling the world as a musician and presenter and speaker for many, many years. And uh, I think either has presented in the hundreds or thousands of times, uh, Ms. Nessun's uh, theory in physics and the ancient cultures aspect and uh, has a really great perspective on all this. And he also has one of our elective programs about ancient cultures. So uh, Jimmy, why don't you share a little bit about all that? Yeah, thanks, Marshall. Yeah, I have a course called Ancient Egypt Revisited. It was created after we did the Resonance Science Foundation trip to Egypt in 2017. Um, and it's you know, a compilation of a lot of research from a lot of different perspectives. And it's actually pretty focused on three sites, really the Great Pyramid, the Sphinx, and the Osirian Temple in Abydos, which is, you know, a few hundred kilometers south down the Nile. But I think Egypt is just an example of a greater picture that is starting to come into focus. And I just wanted to bring it to a broad perspective, which is that what's happening now in the study of ancient civilizations is the similar process that's happening in the study of physics, where roughly a hundred-ish years ago, pioneers in the fields established a way of looking at things and a process that they started to go down 
And a lot of people jumped onto that and they went pretty far in one direction. And they may have taken a wrong turn a long time ago, but no one caught it in the textbooks. And so we continue to propagate this story, whatever the story is, that the slaves had vine ropes and they were pulling them or that space is empty and it has no energy in it. Whatever the thing is, it's now being corrected because we've got a new perspective and new evidence that's changing the way we're looking at these same things. And it's kind of glacial in some ways, how long it takes for the whole, the whole society and the whole field of science and of physics and of anthropology and archeology span to turn. It's kind of like trying to turn a cruise ship with oars. You can do it, the physics is there, but it's not as fast as having, you know, a warp drive or whatever, right? So thankfully there are folks like Graham Hancock and other incredibly astute researchers out there, the John Anthony Wests of the world and Robert Schock, and then folks that we're working with currently now with like people like Alan Green, who's worked extensively on the geometry of the Great Pyramid of Giza. And I'm excited to announce, I guess it's maybe been mentioned before because Alan did a a video with us, but Alan's working on this awesome elective course that he'll get into some of this stuff. But if you haven't checked out the work of Alan Green, he goes by Bard Code on Facebook and Instagram. And he's gone deep into the proportions of the Great Pyramid, as has Robert Edward Grant, who's working on Leonardo da Vinci's work, who probably it looks like went to Egypt and had access to ancient manuscripts that may no longer be with us and encoded very fundamental geometries and relationships in the Great Pyramid into his art. And all this points ultimately to a history that goes much farther back than anybody was really willing to accept. And certainly the Egyptians are very proud of their objects and sites that are in the country. And they don't necessarily want history to be rewritten that the Egyptians found the pyramids and said, oh, this is a really cool spot. Let's set up a city next to this. It could be that the pyramids are way older than dynastic Egypt. Dynastic Egypt meaning the time of the pharaohs, which is when we all think that the, you know, the traditional story would say that the Great Pyramid was built in the time of the pharaohs by Khufu and Khufu's son and the son after that, Ankare. And so if that's not true, it's like Nassim pulling the rug out of the standard model and going, yeah, if we're not exactly totally sure about the dimensions, if we're not perfectly correct about how dimensions work, then no wonder we're having problems trying to find all this mass, for example, that we can't find. And it's because we were looking at the whole thing in the wrong perspective. And so we're starting to turn our perspective in a new direction, not just in the physics and in the archeology, span but across all science, across all philosophies, religions, and you can see that happening and playing out on a daily basis yeah. in all the insanity that's going on out there in the world. <laughs> yeah, and that's for sure. There's people like you guys who I call, you know, seed humans, important seed humans on the surface of this planet at this time, who for whatever reason, not by accident, are on this Zoom or watching us on Facebook right now. You guys are at the edge of that wave of looking at things in a new way or you probably wouldn't be here. And so I'm just calling you guys out and giving you a shout out and saying thank you for supporting Nassim and all these other researchers that dared to stick their neck out pretty hard and be like, okay, send the tomatoes. I know you're gonna throw tomatoes, you know, but you know, like Nassim's Italian, he makes really good sauce with those tomatoes actually. <laughs> You can throw the tomatoes. He's going to be like, oh, yeah, OK, throw those tomatoes, because here's the math. Does this equation work out? Go ahead. Anybody, it doesn't matter who wrote this equation. It's math. Check it out. That's the difference between somebody like Nassim and somebody who isn't using math. Math is a very, very potent language because it's directly based on geometry, which is directly based on the structure of our reality. and so. If you're basing your whole thing on something like the Planck distance, the only natural unit that we have in the universe, then your math is probably pretty solid. And so when somebody like Nassim or somebody like Robert or Alan are busting out proofs based on ratios, based on geometry, based on frequency and vibration and resonance, 
that stuff is fundamental. It's not, oh, I think God is like this and here's my story. It's like, here's this fundamental aspect about reality. What do you think? And when you present it like that to people, then they go, oh, yeah, that probably seems right. Because I just got like crazy goosebumps. I don't usually get goosebumps. And so maybe I should look into this. And now we have millions of people around the world doing that. And so now, thanks to the Resident Science Foundation collaborating with many other organizations that are also doing this, we're doing this exponential fractal growth of positive, resonant seed information. And as we know, the only thing that ever causes change is these little pockets of coherency forming. And then it accumulates and it eventually grows exponentially. And then you make the change. And so we're following in a yeah. tradition of folks like Buck, Mr. Fuller, thank you, Bucky, of like, we're not fighting yeah. the existing reality. That's a kind of a lot of waste of energy. We're actually just building the new paradigm and making it so coherent that people go, oh, yeah, that makes sense. I was always wondering about those slaves with the vine ropes. Yeah, maybe they had an advanced technology and how did they get that? Maybe it wasn't from around here. And then you start going, wait, what do you mean it's not from around here? I thought we were the only intelligent life in the universe. And it just goes from there, right? It leads to the biggest questions you can ask and the biggest answers you can give. Right. And when it all starts to come together, it gets really fun. And so that's why this is like so endlessly interesting for me. And I can go around the world continuously talking about this and I never get bored. Yeah. So thank you to Sim for <laughs> turning me on to all this stuff and pointing me to researchers that you found previously and, and did a summary of their work. Because when I first saw the Sim speak, I was like, oh, this guy's onto it. And I want to try to explain it to people. And it's not simple, as you know, if somebody comes up to you and says, oh, that guy, Nassim Haramain, I've heard of that. What does that guy say? You guys are like, uh, there's a bunch of stuff and it's all connected. Yes, exactly. Good work. That's the two second unified field theory talk. And now you guys are all little, you know, not little, but your emissaries for the universe. We all are. We're, you know, spreading important resonant information. And we really need that in these times as we try to stop the direction that the cruise ship is going, which is not looking like a very great direction, could probably be adjusted slightly towards a more fun, less dissonance, let's just say consonance way of thinking. And um, yeah, thank you, Nassim and Marshall and all the Residence Academy folks for helping to propagate that entire field. Thank yeah, you, thanks, Jamie. Jamie has been thanks, such an Jamie. amazing, you know, uh, contributor to our team for so many years. And I, I think as well, you know, what he was saying is important because um, it's like every part makes the whole, you know, and like every individual that gets it and sees the bigger picture, you know, and see beyond the boundaries, beyond the religions and see the unification and the understanding. Like one thing I didn't say about the art is that it's clear when you study it, for instance, that it was long before it was with the Bragg community. It was, you know, in the pyramids, you know, and most likely, you know, long before it was the power source in the pyramids, uh, and the Egyptian were around it. Um, it. It was probably there long before that as well, and so on. So it's not a set of information that's, you know, related to a religion, to a certain culture, but that it's a set of information that's universal and that is really actually fundamental to each person. Like each person is like a mini arc running you know a vortex in space time and each person is making such a difference in making you know in directing our world today which you know is very much suffering um from uh self-inflicted wounds um and uh, when all of the information required for us to like jamie says have I have more fun I mean, and uh, and be able to have infinite amount of resources, be able to have, you know, gravity control <clears throat> allowing us to go 
across the solar system, across the galaxy, so on. Uh, like all this is available to us. It's all there. All the science, all the knowledge, everything, the capacity, everything is there. We have the power to do it. Um, and what we have to have is the willingness of the community, of the, of the population to go there and to not allow anything else um, and, and to, you know, uh, direct our attention towards that possibility, be, towards that ultimate outcome for humanity. A lot of things in the world right now are being uncovered, um, including, you know, some of the corruption that has been leading this world, this world into literally a brick wall. And um, we, you know, so so allowing it to open, supporting the opening, including for us, you know, getting over the fears, get, you know, staying calm, staying open, staying um, connected, feeling that field at the at the center of our existence, leading us to this new possibility for humanity. Every single one of you that does this make a huge difference on the planet, a huge, especially at this moment where the morphogenetic field is such in a uh, state of chaos and flux. You know, you have to be the anchor. You know, you have to be that beam of you know, of information um, that's holding the field to this higher possibility. It's so critical at this time. Yeah. Well said. Absolutely true. Yeah. So uh, thank you, Jamie, for your um, overview of your work. I'm just going to just share my screen here for a moment. Yeah, thanks, Marla. I just wanted to uh, say thank you guys to the comments because I wasn't obviously reading comments as I was talking, but I just went back and read all your comments. It's awesome to hear from all you guys in the comments. And uh, I love hearing where people are from. I never get over it that we can talk in, in real time and that there's people all over the globe right now uh, in different countries and different time zones. So this is a type of time travel that we're doing right now this we're we're living in the future and the past right now here we are on zoom looking at a picture of the great pyramid of Giza. i mean it's tying it all together and it, and it, it alludes to the fact that time and the universe itself is hollow fractographic or hollow fractal if you want to call it which is it's a fractal mm -hmm. and a hologram at the same time which means that all points contain all the information right that there's a singularity in the center of everything including us, and so we have chaos. access to that at all times, which is pretty awesome to remember and to be able to remind people of. When you remind people of that, you're doing them a great favor. So I, I just reminding you to remind everybody else <laughs> that we're all the center of the universe, every single person. Right, all connected. which is Thank important you. to remember when you realize you're at the center of the universe, don't forget that everybody else is as well, because then it'll be a problem <laughs> if you do, you know. Yeah, it's, it's <laughs> very important. <laughs> so Jamie's, uh, Jamie's and other our other elective courses are found under the courses link, uh, and you can enroll in Jamie's. It's sixty-four dollars. It's a great, great uh, price for this immense uh, dive into uh, ancient. Egypt and Jamie's a fantastic photographer as well and you can see lots of pictures here of Abydos and temples and the Sphinx and the pyramids so you can check it all out there online. Um, we should take thanks, Jimmy. Questions. So yeah so Nassim actually I wanted to kind of touch into uh, in a way what you were just talking about with the state of our world but also how this ties into the the what we've learned from the past and what we're, know, what we're coming to understand now, I, I noticed there were many questions having to do with, uh, with the, the role and the effect and the influence of sound in, uh, in both technologies that may have been used within these ancient sites and temples, and even possibly to build them in some ways. And as well, you know, how sound is, is directly related to the insight physics theory. Um, based upon 
resonance and the acoustical Im, uh, impulses that uh, is what sound is. So um, right. many questions, curious about the role of sound in all of this. Is that something you want to yeah. talk about a little bit? And I, I want to, I just saw another question that I'd like to address as well. And uh, how yeah, does go God it. and praying to God have a place in unified physics? I think that's a good question as well. Um, and um, I wanted to say that um, there's a few things. One is that, um, you know, uh, when, if you ask the world, uh, anybody in the world, you know, if they have a concept of God, what they would describe that God or this idea of God, how they would describe it. And typically what you're going to get is that it's everywhere. It connects everything. It knows everything. It's created everything. And, you know, it's organizing everything. Um, and it, it, it's guiding everybody. Um, um, now, um, uh, and you'll find that across many different cultures. Uh, and if you were to relate that description to unified physics, then you would end up with, you know, God equals vacuum information, right? It's at the base of everything. It made everything. It organizes everything, it connects everything, and it's the network that's talking to it, you know, basically in feedback, feed forward. This is, is the whole thing is God, right? So then, um, you know, so now um, you can get rid of the dogma, you know, that is attached to the word God. So if you want to pray to God, that's fine. Uh, you're praying to the universe. You're praying. You're praying to the vacuum. You're praying to to the structure of space. He, he, the issue with the word God is that it brings up, you know, um, uh, ideas that are typically associated with very specific sets of uh, beliefs um, in different cultures. And what's beautiful about this is that it unifies these beliefs to realize, wow. We were all talking about the same thing. We just described it differently. And it is the fundamental dynamic of creation. And if you want to call it God, it's fine. Uh, and if you want to, and then it's not separate from the physics of reality. It's not something that's outside of you. It's or something that's only inside of you. It's something that's everywhere that actually made reality um, and that's making reality continuously. It's not like it made it then, and then it's like it's just been running since then. It's continuously making reality, and it's it's based on physics, meaning that like it it's not a separate like the fact that consciousness can emerge from this physics shows you that the the whole thing is conscious. The whole thing is what we call God, and and including you. Um, and, and, uh, and so that, that's really, I, I thought we should answer that because that, that's a question that's important. And then on, uh, on, right. on the role of sound, um, I think that, um, uh, that it's important to realize that sound is, um, you know, a, an oscillation, uh, in a medium, um, uh, and you can imagine that there is oscillations in mediums at different scales, you know, so that you could have oscillation in the medium of space as Maxwell thought about it uh, as, you know, and, and wrote his equations for the electromagnetic field from it. Um, and you can imagine that these oscillation in the space or in, in the medium of the ether, as Maxwell described it in the vacuum, you know, may be happening at much higher frequency and much higher energy level than the sound you hear, uh, you know, with the fairly limited senses that you have if you're only using your external senses. And that um, this, this limitation um, makes us have 
very specific division between oscillation when all when when we know from unified physics that they're they're not separate but they're part of a continuum they're different frequency of oscillations in you know so you can have radio waves you get all kinds of things including sound waves right you can have and then you can have electromagnetic waves and then there's a very small part of the spectrum of electromagnetic waves that we see and then there's all these other you know different higher frequency that we might not see and um and then the you know all the way down to the Planck scale which is very high high frequency very very high energy level uh, very short wavelength and so you can imagine that if you're trying to influence space or the Planck field with a technology uh, you would use you could use like oscillation in the sound region to um, kind of like octavize or harmonize, creating harmonic relationship to the very, very small to influence it, you know? So those would be like certain dynamics you see in, for instance, plasma, like phonons, acoustons, these type of dynamic resonating cavities, resonating structures that uh, would produce very focused phenomena that would alter the space, um, increase the amount of information flow in the space. And so uh, sound is very much part of that. Resonating cavities is very much part of that. Um, and, and so it plays a role in this unified view, but as well, it plays a role in the technological developments of this unified view. It's part of these dynamics that eventually come together to produce various effects like gravity control or energy production and so on. Yeah. And Marshall, you did a lot of work on this in your book, Cosmometry. Uh, so I'm happy. I do, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um... Yeah, my, my book, Cosmometry, is um, combining the cosmic geometry. That's why I call it Cosmometry. I, like you, Nassim, have not really been a big fan of the name Sacred Geometry for this field of knowledge because, it, for one, uh, most scientists are not going to refer to their work as Sacred Geometry. And so, uh, so I, I chose this word, Cosmometry, which actually has existed for many hundreds of years but uh, really hasn't been in use. And it's the combination of the cosmic geometry, your unified physics model, and music, and how they all are based on one unified system, very much based on what, you, what we talked about in the beginning of this module five with Buckminster Fuller's synergetics geometry and the vector equil equilibrium, uh, which directly is associated with the the system of music and the underlying geometry of your physics model. And right. so, uh, you know, for a much more deep dive into that aspect of what this module is exploring, you can check out my book, Cosmometry at cosmometry.com, C-O-S-M-O-N-M-O-M-E-T-R-Y, cosmometry.com. And it's available on Amazon. That's where you get my book, print on demand, and a Kindle version as well. So. Okay, more questions. Um, there's some good ones. Do we have any time left? A little bit. We have 15 minutes, yeah. I Two, keep babbling. It's all good. <laughs> you're, you're not the tower of Babel, you're the fountain of Babel. Babel. <laughs> <laughs> you know, some of these right. questions are deep questions, so they take some time to you know describe i know yeah it's true like the nature of god you know <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, let's see what's a good place to go there's questions about i lost a bunch of go ahead no i I'm, my 
my account signed out, so I lost a lot of the questions. That oh, were I see. Here initially. Maybe, yeah. Jamie, um, do you have good ones you want to ask? There's some questions about um, uh, the, uh, the, you know, the relationship to string theory. That's not so much in you this. You know, one thing, that, one thing that occurred to me in, this, um, in, in terms of tying this into the uh, ancient cultures topic is the there's clear evidence presented in these ancient cultures of a an advanced civilization um what we would call ets extraterrestrial civilization or or beings that provided this advanced technology and seeded the culture at that time that then built these structures that we don't know how we don't have the capacity to build today in what we call our own advanced civilization. Right. And so uh, very much indicating an origin to the, the deep history of this planet that um, we could say uh, in a way even precedes the, the emergence of humanity on the planet and possibly even seeded it, um, which I know we touch into a bit into the module. Uh, and then I was thinking about the recent announcements from the Pentagon and the prior announcement from a few years ago of the, of the UFOs, you know, like the Pentagon right. officially saying, yeah, okay, this, this video is real and we acknowledge it now and beginning right. to talk about those things in, in right. the mainstream media. Yeah. Um, I would love yeah, to maybe comment, just comment on, that. on that for a little bit. Yeah. yeah. I, I would love to comment on that. I, I think it's remarkable that it was released in the middle of this very specific moment uh, in history that the Pentagon uh, would all of a sudden release these videos that are from, you know, pilots that are encountering um, UFOs or um, crafts of so-called unknown origin uh, and um, that um, the, uh, you know, that really, you know, had been all, already released a few years ago um, because they leaked out a few years ago. So they basically were confirming the veracity of those, uh, of, of those videos and that data. And, um, you know, some people are talking about how, you know, all those crafts are, must be from the black budgets, you know, they're part of our government, you know, uh, uh, capabilities and so on. It's, un it's unlikely that the Pentagon would release um, publicly information about deep state black budgets, um, you know, um, and, and so, because uh, it would be defeating their own purpose of having black budget. Um, and so I think it's much more likely that these objects are uh, from extraterrestrial origin. The writing that came with the disclosure supports that view um, and that it was, it's not something that, that other governments have the ca capability of, um, um, but, uh, or not saying that our governments don't have these type of capabilities um, and we don't need to get in the middle of that debate. The fact is, is that there is most likely a lot of life in our universe, a lot. Um, those are facts. So let's just go off the facts, you know, and at the latest published material, well, you know, it's 2013, it's much, most likely much more now, we're talking about 40 trillion, um, uh, 40, 40 billion galaxy, uh, I'm sorry, planets in our galaxy alone that could sustain, you know, um, life. Uh, you know, and this is a very, very loose estimate that is, it's estimated very conservatively. It's making very fundamental assumptions about how many planets there is around the sun and, um, and where life
can emerge. You know, it's making assumptions about the temperature that must be on these planets, their distance from their sun and so on, where life as we know it could emerge. But we know throughout history, many times we've been confronted with places where we thought life could not uh, exist and discovering that it does, like for instance, in very hot vents deep into the in the ocean where we thought no way there's life down there. And when we finally get there with robot submarine and all this, we see all kinds of life thriving down there. But let's just assume that we're talking as life we, as we know it. Um, we have billions of planets in the galaxy alone. We have trillions of galaxies, two trillions or so uh, in the last count. And so that, you know, the amount of life that, and, and everywhere we look in the universe, we find, um, you know, spectral lines of water. We know there's water everywhere. Um, we see amino acids floating in huge clouds, you know, interstellar cloud of amino acid floating in space and so on. All the pieces, all the building blocks of life are present. The universe is full of life. This is overwhelmingly evident at this point. Most physicists would agree at this point, although they would have violently, you know, disagreed 20 years ago as they did. Um, most physicists would agree there's most likely a lot of life out there, and there's most likely a lot of life that has thousands, if not millions of years ahead of us. And the idea that they could go across the universe um, you know, um, it's with, without difficulty after thousands of years more evolution than us or millions of years more evolution than us is most likely. Uh, if we look at just our evolution in 150 years, we went from horse and buggy to putting satellites up and going to the moon and all this stuff. And, uh, you know, and we go across the world in a plane without thinking about it. Well, these days we might think about it a little more, but you know we have that capability. Uh, something that would be like completely voodoo to somebody a hundred years ago, um, uh, and um, and so basically, uh, you know, there's most likely a lot of life out there. There's most likely a lot of civilization that can make it across the universe, across the galaxy. And that could have found us a very long time ago. And then there's all the evidence from ancient civilization that there was contact early on from this earlier civilization that talked about sun gods, that talked about their knowledge coming from the stars, coming from people that could float up in the air, you know, and, and all this stuff. And then there's the modern evidence, which is overwhelming from military personnel to you know, airplane, commercial airplane pilots, to, uh, all kinds of folks all around the world that are, you know, recording these devices and all this stuff uh, in our airspace. And there's been a lot lately, actually. Um, and so basically, uh, you know, you just look at the facts and you look at the evidence and it's overwhelmingly supportive that there is a contact that has been initiated a very long time ago. And even a lot of strong evidence that the human um, genome uh, sequence may actually have been altered to, produ to produce the Homo sapien, sapien specifically, um, you know, and that there was alteration of the gene that, you know, were. GMOs in some ways, and that, you know, um, this was part of a evolutionary process that involved the larger community than just the Earth. Yeah, <laughs> a lot of evidence. Yeah. Um, more and more activity pointing in that direction. These right. Days. Yeah. And there's yeah. a reason why, you know, ancient alien and all this kind of shows on, on history channels and other channels are the most popular uh, shows. Yeah. Yeah. It is because the we population, 
yeah, it be, people, you know, have this sense um, that something extraordinary happened in our deep past. Yeah. Well, we're clearly in an extraordinary time, and uh, we're going through a, a massive transitional process right now. I believe that uh, a lot of this knowledge and the deeper understanding about the nature of our universe and our world through understanding the unified science, unified physics, and um, the aspects that have been holding this knowledge back for quite a while. All these things seem to be coming to the surface now, which is good. And it's challenging and it can be overwhelming and it's destabilizing in many ways. I know, I think the entire world is in a kind of like suspended animation right now of like, where are we and what's about to happen and where are we gonna go? So right. within that is a great opportunity actually. And uh, it's like you said in earlier, it's so important for everybody here listening to, to really tune into their center inside and to, to really connect in with the, that direct knowing that we are this universal field, this field of consciousness and energy and matter. We influence it in every moment. And by, by becoming stable inside of ourselves, we can really bring coherence to this time that we're in. And that will help tremendously for these breakthroughs that are wanting to come through now through what Nassim is doing in the laboratory, others are doing around the world in healing and environmental restoration. All these are capacities we have and uh, they tie back into what came from ancient knowledge and, and beyond. Um, and this is, this is the time now it feels like at least it's an initiation of this period of this great transition that we're in. And, uh, Right. We feel confident that what we have can can be brought forth now and your everybody's support for helping to make that happen through connecting with other people, um, becoming a member of Resident Science Foundation to help us with the support of getting this communication out there. All of it is so important. And it's we're, so critical. We're so grateful for everybody. Yeah. Yeah. Really critical. So critical and we are so grateful for everybody participating, you know. 20,000 people taking the course right now is so critical. And this is why I released it for free on the, uh, on the internet, even though the foundation is uh, struggling financially because um, it's really important for, for people to know this information at this point. And I didn't want any barrier to entry to be able to access the information. And, um, and I, it really makes a huge difference for each individual as well, you know, in the context of our, you know, um, you know, everybody, at least most of the people, I mean, everybody I've talked to, um, but I'm probably biased because the people that talk to me are the people that <laughs> were excited about the course. However, um, you know, people I've talked to um, all, including my kids, when they took the course, um, <laughs> were transformed um you know in some ways mm. from taking the course they uh, there was deep realization there was deep moments of contemplation of thinking about things of thinking about themselves and understanding the world differently and uh the history of the world as well differently and their relationship to the um, larger community of uh the universe differently and so on that made it so that um, there was like a transition in their, in their existence um, that, you know, in some cases produced very powerful direct effect um, in their life, you know, um, and those, you know, and, and that has to do with like when you get closer and closer to your essence, right, you, you, it's like the coherency goes up, the crystal the geometry lines up and the crystal becomes more translucent, right? Uh, a quartz crystal is, is translucent when the geometry is very, very highly coherent um, and, uh, and light is, in it is less impeded when it, it moves through it. More information can move through that oscillator. More information can move 
through your bio crystal uh, existence, um, more you are a resonating cavity in the morphogenetic field of the of the holofractal uh, world and and community, and more influence you have on it, and that you know, and that influence is a positive influence. You're putting energy in the system. You're putting information in the system that produce coherency in your own body, in your own existence, in your own life, and in the life of others all around the world. And so being part of this community and, and moving forward with this information is very, very critical. And that is why I'm excited to be able to share it at very specifically at this time um, in this way so that we can become so strong. You know, the other really cool thing about the geometry of molecular structures and crystals is that if it becomes extremely coherent, it can become extremely resilient, um, you know, and, and, and very solid, very great foundation, very powerful foundation. Uh, for life, for emergence, for transformation, for evolution, which is really what's going on right now in the world. And uh, um, it's been going on for a long time. We were at, we're at one of those moments of nexus. And in that nexus uh, moment, it's really important that we can keep our nodes, our, you know, um, uh, uh, coherence, at its highest so that we can be pillars for the, for others, for the community, the global community uh, as a whole. Yeah. Yeah. You can say sad, but we'll leave those as the last words for this session today. And just want to remind everybody that um, we have one more session in this six weeks series um, of the overview of our course. That's next week, next Wednesday at this time for module six, which is about the implications and the applications of unified physics. And, um, and then after that, we'll be doing these live with the SIM Q and A's once a month and faculty Q and A's once a month as part of the course. And that's through the membership uh, program. And we can talk about that a little bit more next week. Um, but, you know, it's $5 a month is what the, the uh, minimum fee for that subscription fee and and that gets you access to these exact kind of discussions we're having uh with the community and with the sim and with the faculty so and, also, um, and of course a reminder, that's very supportive of us as well go ahead Vin. a reminder that this also happens in french you guys and opening yeah. tomorrow in on french Thursdays, as well. uh, the french is a couple of weeks behind the english so that'll be going on and it's nassim and olivier uh, answering questions in French for the whole French community. You can find the website is fr.resonantscience.org. And uh, the academy and the calls are all in French. And coming up down the pike, we're going to have Spanish coming up next. And then there's the idea of doing many other languages following that. So let us know what languages you want to see coming up. And just a reminder that you guys can all do the stuff that we're doing right now. Uh, the way Nassim has inspired us, you can now go inspire other people. And when it's hard to explain all this stuff, just get them to take the course and then they thank you and, you're, yeah. and then they're with us. And so thank you guys for yeah. being those seed humans and spreading the word on all this uh, and the work of the foundation and Nassim and Marshall and everybody. Thanks. Thanks, Jimmy. And thanks, Nassim. And thanks everybody for being here today. We had a wonderful session once again. And uh, we'll have a good week. Take good care of yourself and all those around you. And we'll see you next week. And that's in. Yes, thank you so much and um, for being here, for supporting this, and from the, you know, the dedication you all have um, to meeting us here and to making a change in the world. I know it's been maybe a little, um, uh, uh, stressful these days or you're hard for you or you're experiencing some difficulties, uh, hang in there. This is, this is the moment we've been waiting for. This is the moment we can emerge. This is the moment 
that you can transform and uh, transcend um, the earlier limitations. And it's a, in, it's, it can be a difficult moment and it's a beautiful moment at the same time. So until next week, may the vacuum be with you, be safe, take care of yourself <laughs> and the people around you. And I love you all and we'll see you soon. All right. Bye, everybody. Take good care. Uh, See you next week. Bye.